the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam preached La ilaha illallah, and many are the miracles that he has been given. Really, we can talk hours and hours about the number of miracles. They don't number in the hundreds; they number in the thousands. But his greatest miracle was the miracle of the Quran. Ever used to worship Allah azza wa jal? Then Allah is Al Hayy, the ever living, who never dies. Fundamentals of faith. Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa min walah. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our deeds. Verily, whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, there is no one that can misguide Him. And whoever He misguides, then there is none that can guide Him back. I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his prophet and messenger. Verily, the best book is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best guidance is the guidance of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all matters are innovations into the religion of Islam for every single innovation qualifies as a bid'ah and every single bid'ah leads to the fire of hell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And today, insha'Allah, we are starting a new series entitled Fundamentals of Faith. I am your host, Abu Ammar Yasir Qadi, and we're going to embark together on a journey in which we will discuss the fundamentals that every single Muslim must be aware of and know in order to be a Muslim. But before we start these actual concepts, it is important that we discuss an introductory topic. And that is the importance of knowledge, the importance of Islamic knowledge. So today's talk will be, insha'Allah, the importance and the blessings of Islamic knowledge. <laughs> know, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised knowledge and He has raised the status of its people. In Surah Al-Mujadala, verse 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises the status of those who have belief amongst you and those who have knowledge. So the status of the people of knowledge is raised in this world because people will look up to them and show them respect and it will be raised in the hereafter as well because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter them into the highest places of Jannah because of their knowledge. It is through knowledge that the superiority of Adam alayhi salam was shown to the angels. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 31, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah taught Adam the names of everything. And then He showed those things to the angels. And He asked the angels to inform Him, to inform Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the names of those things if they knew. So the angels responded that they did not have that knowledge. So through this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the superiority of Adam over the angels through the blessing of ilm. It is this very superiority that also raises the status of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam over all other mankind. Allah subhanahu wa taala reminds the Prophet in the Quran, "Wa anzal Allahu alayk al kitab wal hikma." Allah subhanahu wa taala has revealed the kitab, the Quran, and the hikma, meaning the Sunnah, wisdom. Wa alama kamalam takun taalam, and He taught you. Allah subhanahu wa taala taught you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him. Knowledge that you did not know. وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا Because of this knowledge, your, the blessings that Allah has over you are very many. So it is this knowledge that makes our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that extra special person, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised his status and raised him above all of mankind. So great is their status, the people of knowledge, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself testifies on their behalf. In Surah Al Imran verse 18, and this ayah, by the way, scholars state this ayah is the greatest testimony that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the ulama, the scholars. This is the greatest blessing 
this ayah. This ayah starts off, شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ Allah has borne witness and testified that there is no object worthy of worship except Him. There is no deity except Him. And the angels, وَالْمَلَائِكَةَ also testify to this. وَأُلُوا الْعِلْمِ And the people of knowledge also testify. Why is this ayah so great? Why is it such a good tiding to the people of knowledge? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself testifies on their behalf without them having to do anything. They remain silent and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies regarding the people of knowledge. And Allah describes them in the same verse, قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْطِ They are standing firmly with justice. Likewise, it is the scholars, the ulama, who truly understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ These are the parables that we make for mankind in the Qur'an. And it is only the scholars who understand these parables. It is the scholars who are not swayed by their desires and are blessed with wisdom. They are the ones who remain firm when all of mankind goes astray. Describing the incident of Qarun. Qarun was one of the people of the children of Israel during the time of Musa. And he was rich. So rich that the Qur'an describes him as having so many treasure chests, chests full of gold and silver and jewels, that the keys to those chests could not be held except by a strong group of men. And even that would be difficult for them. Just the keys, not the treasure chests themselves. That's how rich he was. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his story in the Qur'an and what happened to him. And of what he says in Surah Al-Qasas, verse 79, Allah says, So Qarun came out amongst his people, wearing his finery, wearing the beautiful clothes that he had. And Allah describes the people around him as saying, Ya Laytalana, how woe to us, how we wish that we had been given what Qarun has been given. They thought that the treasures of this world were the real treasures, the most important treasures. So they wished to be given what Qarun has been given. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, the people of knowledge were not of that attitude. Those that have knowledge, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ The people of ilm, knowledge, they said, وَيْلَكُمْ Woe to you! ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ The rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has is better for you than what Qarun has been given. And while he was walking in his finery, bedecked in his dazzling beauty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the earth to open up in, underneath him. And he fell down into the earth. And the people, the people of knowledge and the uh, people that were not knowledgeable and the ones that wished to be in his position a few seconds ago, they saw with their own eyes Qarun falling down. At that point, they praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the people of knowledge, their superiority was shown. Is that if Allah had willed, he would have punished us because we wanted to be like him. So it was the people of knowledge that saved them and they were the ones that were not swayed by their desires. Therefore, the only command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an, in which he is commanded to ask for something more, is that of knowledge. Allah commands the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Taha, verse 114, Say, O Muhammad, O my Lord, increase me in my knowledge. Increase me in my knowledge. In fact, knowledge is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a person. Akhi Kareem, if you can give me volume 1 of Sahih Bukhari, we're going to look up a hadith. We're going to look up a hadith which discusses this beautiful concept. Now he is going to give me Sahih al-Bukhari. And Sahih al-Bukhari is the most authentic book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by consensus of all of the Muslims. And the author's name is Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. He died in the year 256 Hijra. In the first volume of his book, he has Kitab al-Ilm, the chapter of knowledge. Showing you how important it is. Before he even talks about salah and prayer and fasting and charity, he talks about knowledge. And of the chapters that he has, is that chapter number 13 is, whoever Allah wishes good for, he guides him to knowledge. And the hadith in here is, the Prophet wasallam said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah wishes good for, he wants to do something good to him, he gives him a knowledge of the religion. So it is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone when a person starts studying Islam. And when he increases his knowledge of how to worship of Allah, how to worship of Allah, how or who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. How should I pray? What should I do here? 
What does the Quran teach me? What does the Sunnah teach me? When a person's interest increases, when he starts learning more about the religion, this is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him. Whoever Allah wishes good for, He gives him an understanding of this religion. So blessed is knowledge that the blessings of a person of knowledge do not finish when he dies. Any good that we do when we finish, that, that, that deed is finished. We pray, when we die we're not going to pray. We give charity, when we die we're not going to give charity. But there are certain deeds that when we do them even in this life, the benefits and the rewards continue and last even after we die. Eternity, until the day of judgment. Of these things is a beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a person dies, all of his good deeds finish. They are cut off. Nothing is left except for three things. The first one is a continual charity. For example, if he built a hospital or he built a, a school and the people continue to study there or, or use it after he dies, he will be rewarded for that. The second is knowledge that he taught which other people benefit from. So if you taught someone how to pray, then as long as that person is living and praying, you will continue to get rewarded and of course he will also be rewarded for the prayer. And if he happens to teach someone else that knowledge, then he will be rewarded and you also because you were the one who spread that knowledge. Likewise, if someone writes a book or if someone records something on a cassette of, of benefit and knowledge, then even after he dies, as long as people come and they benefit from this book or this cassette, and they seek knowledge from it, then he will be rewarded even if he is in his grave. And the third thing that the Prophet ﷺ said is a pious child that continues to pray for him. It is the ulama or the people of knowledge who are the inheritors of the Prophet ﷺ because they are the ones who collectively take the status of the prophets in guiding the ummah, in teaching the people. They collectively take the status of the Prophets because there will be no Prophet after the Prophet ﷺ. So when the Prophet ﷺ has passed away and he has passed away, who will take on the responsibility of guiding the Muslim Ummah, of teaching them what they need to know? Of course, the ulama or the people of knowledge will never equal the Prophets. The Prophets are obviously way above any other human beings. But they will take on collectively some of the responsibilities that the Prophet ﷺ had of guiding the Ummah, of teaching them what they need to know of telling them what to do, when to do, and how to do it. The Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith in, Sahih, uh, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi that إِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ هُمْ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ That the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. The scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. And there's a very beautiful hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi which we will look, uh, which we'll look up after taking a short break inshallah. So stay tuned and as soon as we take this break we'll go to the hadith inshallah. <laughs> Oh my Lord, make me brave, brave, brave. And make my path easy for me. Intaza Khudao me bada sab se watan hai. Jo peran uska hai wo mazhat ka kafan. This is nationalism, racism. Hamare jaisa koi nahi. Hani says, jo karega intiaz rango khum mid jayega. So whosoever will resort to the distinction of color and blood will perish. Turki khargahe ho ya arabi wala gar. Though he may be a majestic Turk or a blue-blooded Arab. This is the law of God. You discriminate on grounds of race, language, color or riches, you will perish. Man with a mission. Tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. UK and 9.30 p.m. Europe on Peace TV. Why the West is coming to Islam? Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Whether it be atheism, secularism, Marxism, communism, Westernism, Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all. Islam is not a religion only for the West. It's a religion for the whole of humankind. Dr. Zakir Naik speaks on why the West is coming to Islam in Truth Exposed. The Prophet wasallam said, Each person's every joint must perform a charity. Purity is half of faith. Every day of our lives, every part of our body is owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
in worship. Every step you take towards the place of prayer is charity. Gratitude for our creation, gratitude for our health, gratitude for everything which we receive from Allah SWT is our daily requirement as Muslims. Watch Amar Amanet in Prophetic Hadith every Wednesday at 11.30 p.m. UK and 12.30 a.m. Europe on Peace TV. Welcome back. We were discussing the blessings of knowledge and the importance of studying Islamic knowledge. And we had just started talking about a very beautiful hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, if you can hand it to me, volume 4 of Sunan al-Tirmidhi. Sunan al-Tirmidhi is a book written by Muhammad ibn Isa from the city of Tirmidhi, which is why he is called Tirmidhi. And this book is a very comprehensive book, so much so that, that when the author wrote it, Imam al-Tirmidhi, he wrote in the introduction to the book that whoever has this book in his house, it is as if he has a prophet speaking in it because he had compiled most of the ahadith that are needed by the average Muslims of their times. And he died in the year 279 Hijrah. He has a, a very beautiful hadith here which we'll discuss in its entirety because of its blessings and benefits. He has also Kitab al or the chapter of knowledge, just like uh, Imam al-Bukhari has. And he has in it that which has been narrated concerning the blessings of studying knowledge. And we have over here this hadith. On Qais, Qais ibn Kathir is the name of a famous companion, uh, sorry, the name of a famous student of the companion. He said, a person came from Medina to visit Abu Darda while he was in Damascus. So Medina, he walked from, or he went, traveled from Medina all the way to Damascus to visit Abu Darda, the famous companion of the Prophet wasallam. So when he came and he entered upon Abu Darda and he told him he's from Medina, Abu Darda asked him, why did you come? O oh, son of my brother, why did you come uh, from, from such a great distance? He said, I heard one hadith that you narrate from the Prophet wasallam. That's why I came. So the man traveled from Medina all the way to Damascus. It would have been more than a month's journey just to hear this one hadith. Look at how the scholars of the past were in their eagerness, their thirst, their desire to study in one hadith. Now we have in front of us books of thousands of a hadith. How many of us take the time to read them? So when he entered upon Abu Darda, Abu Darda was surprised. He said, didn't you have anything else to do? He said, no, that's why I came. <laughs> he said, don't you have any trade, business? You're not going to do anything else? He said, no, nothing else. This is the only reason I came. So, so Abu Darda said, let me narrate to you something that I heard from the Prophet Wasallam. This is not the hadith he came for. He's narrating something else now to, to show him the benefits of blessings. Abu Darda said that I heard from the Prophet wasallam that the Prophet wasallam said, whoever takes a path in search of knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make, because of that path that he took, will make the path to Jannah easy for him. Okay? So any person who goes out in search of knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his path to Jannah easy for him because of that path that he took to search for knowledge. Why? Because when he studies knowledge, when he studies the Qur'an, when he studies the Sunnah, when he studies how to worship Allah, he will start worshipping Allah. So when he starts worshipping Allah, obviously his path to Jannah will be made easy for him. The hadith goes on, it hasn't finished yet. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and the angels lower their wings over the student of knowledge, the one who seeks knowledge. Which means that the angels are flying around, as we know, when they see a student of knowledge, they stop flying, they come and be with him. And the presence of angels is a blessed presence. It also has the connotation that the angels lower their wings of protection. Just like a mother bird will protect its young through its wings, so too the connotation is in this hadith, that the angels will protect the student of knowledge from any harm befalling him. It also shows that the angels love the student of knowledge. That's why they stopped doing what they were doing and they came to accompany him. The hadith still goes on, it hasn't finished. That's why we quoted this hadith. There are many benefits to it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and the scholar, the scholar, every single being that is in the skies and in the earth, so much so that even the ant in its ant hole and the fish in the ocean, they send their blessings, they send their dua upon the one who teaches mankind, the alim, the scholar. Every single being. This is because, this is because the person of knowledge 
benefits himself and he benefits others as well. He will teach them what to do. He will teach them how to do it and what is the best way to do it. And through his teaching, good will spread throughout the earth. And that good will reach the animals as well. So that's why, that's why the animals themselves pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the person of knowledge. The hadith still hasn't finished. The Prophet went on and he said, the superiority, the superiority or the blessings of an alim, of a scholar, over an abid, an worshipper. The worshipper, what does he do? He prays his prayers, he fasts, he gives charity, he's just worshipping Allah. The scholar, he's busy teaching, he's busy studying. The Prophet ﷺ said the superiority of the scholar over the worshipper is like the superiority of the full moon over the stars in the sky. The full moon. Have you ever gone out on a starry night and looked up and seen how bright that moon is? And were it not for the moon, there would be no light on the, on the, on the earth at night. Do you know that a full moon, it actually leaves a shadow in the middle of the night? It's so powerful, the light, that it leaves a shadow even though it's at night. Whereas the stars, even if you put them all together, they would not be able to give you the slightest amount of light or shadow. So the Prophet ﷺ said that the scholars, their superiority over the worshippers is like the superiority of the full moon over the stars in the sky. The hadith still hasn't finished. So you can see why we chose this hadith. And he went on and he said that the ulama, the scholars, are the inheritors of the Prophet ﷺ. The inheritance means that when the Prophet ﷺ leaves, who will take on his position and status? Obviously not completely because the scholars will never become perfect. The scholars will never reach the level of prophets. But collectively, all the scholars put together, they will take on some of the responsibilities of the Prophet ﷺ because they will teach the Ummah. They will teach the Muslims and the non-Muslims about Islam. And they will guide them, instruct them, tell them what they need to know. So because of this, they will take on the responsibility of the ulama, of, of the prophets. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. The prophets do not leave behind gold and silver. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he did not have gold and silver to give. The Prophet ﷺ said, the prophets do not leave behind gold and silver. Rather, they leave behind knowledge. That is their gold. That is their real treasure. The treasure of knowledge. So they leave behind knowledge. And whoever takes this knowledge, this is the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever takes this knowledge, he has indeed taken a great fortune. Much more than what money, much more than what gold and silver can give us. So this beautiful hadith of Sunan al-Tirmidhi, describes for us some of the blessings of knowledge and tells us that the ulama, the main point that we want to narrate from this hadith, the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophet ﷺ. Before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that the knowledge that is praised primarily in the Quran and Sunnah is the knowledge of Islam, the knowledge of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how to worship Him. This is the primary knowledge that is referenced to and praised in the Qur'an. This doesn't mean, obviously, that a person should not study engineering or medicine. Or, no, of course. We have to study these in order to live. But the real knowledge that is praised is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the Qur'an and of the Sunnah. This is the knowledge that brings life to the heart. This is the knowledge that causes people to enter paradise and if they don't have it or don't act upon it, to be deprived from this great blessing and reward. Like the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith we quoted in Sahih Bukhari, in the tradition that is narrated in Sahih Bukhari, whoever Allah wishes good for, what does he do? He gives him an understanding of the religion, deen. So of course, study your knowledge of the secular sciences, very good. But make sure that you also set some time aside to study religious knowledge as well. Because remember the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith narrated by al baghawi and others, that Allah hates every person. Allah does not like those type of people who knows everything about this world, but He is ignorant about the hereafter. There are certain people, they are the greatest scientists, they are the greatest uh, you know, intellectual thinkers, they can produce the greatest things, they can go to the moon as we know. But if you don't worship Allah properly, then of what value is that? That is why the Prophet wasallam stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like such type of people. So with this short introduction, we will now embark upon a series of lectures regarding the most important knowledge, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Allah? What does He want from us? 
Why did he create us? And insha'Allah, we're going to embark on this series together using the Quran and the Sunnah as our guides. And we're going to go step by step. And we hope that insha'Allah, you will attend and pay attention to what is being said so that we can benefit uh, to the greatest uh, extent possible. I will conclude this talk by quoting the angels. When Allah created Adam, the angels, when, when they were shown the superiority of Adam over the angels, the angels said, Subhanaka la ilma lana. They said, Oh Allah, you are exalted above us. You, do, you, you, we have no knowledge except the knowledge that you have taught us. We have no knowledge except the knowledge that you, O oh Allah, has taught us. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with knowledge and He makes us amongst its people and He makes us share at least some of these blessings that have been assigned to the people of knowledge. If there are any questions related to this talk, then inshallah we'll take them now. Um, you mentioned that it's still important to study medicine and engineering and things like that, but how do we find the exact balance between you know, our university life and all the other things we have going on and seeking Islamic knowledge? That's a very important question and one which most of us uh, need an answer for because not everyone's going to leave everything they have and go study 100% Islamic studies. And neither does Islam want us to be like that. Islam wants there to be professionals, engineers, businessmen, doctors, and it also wants people to be full-time scholars. That's how society will flourish and live. You need people doing this and you need people doing that. So each person wants to, needs to assign a role to himself. What does he want to do? If he wishes to be a great scholar, then of course he will have to go full time. But if he wishes to have a secular education, then of course he will have to set aside most of his time for this and at least take a portion of his time also to study Islamic studies as well. So every person has to see his own role, has to see his own status. What does he want out of his life? And based upon that, set aside a schedule. What is important is that a person does assign some portion of his time, even if it's only one hour a week or two hours a week to study some type of basic Islamic knowledge. Inshallah, I hope to see you next time in our series Fundamentals of Faith. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.